Good morning, everyone, uh, and, and welcome uh, to our uh, digital transformation uh, group uh, seminar series. Uh, today, uh, we have our esteemed guest, uh, Dr. Jason Fletcher. Uh, and uh, be before I introduce him, I'll just uh, clarify, I am filling in for panels. He had to go for teaching somewhere. So uh, I am filling in his uh, duty today. I'm Mayur Joshi. I'm a lecturer in FinTech uh, at, uh, in the MSM division. Uh, Jason uh, has, been, has been a wonderful uh, IS scholar and an inspiration for me uh, for uh, during my PhD journey. And, and Many of the high scholars look up to him in terms of uh, uh, his publication records and uh, in terms of uh, uh, the life experiences he shares on uh, professional media, and we all learn from those experiences, especially for the junior scholars. If, if you're not following him already on LinkedIn, do so. Uh, there are so many things uh, to be uh, learned from his uh, posts, so, so I would definitely encourage you to do that. Jason uh, holds uh, Milton uh, uh, Stoffel uh, professorship in uh, the MIS department at Fox School of Business, Temple University. He studies uh, individual decision making, uh, strategic, and work uh, for related issues in the effective application of IT in the organizations. Uh, he, he uses several intransitive information systems, phenomena, and theories in his studies, but he also studies several contemporary uh, issues and technologies and phenomena in terms of, uh, for example, cybersecurity, social media, and his recent uh, papers around AI and strategic implications of AI are very uh, interesting. Uh, Jason has a wonderful track record of publishing at least one FD50 over the past several years, and most of the years you will see that he publishes much more than that. So uh, it's amazing how he does that. And if you get a chance to ask him how he manages to do that, because I'm still wondering. I don't have answers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, recent uh, uh, IS uh, ranking, uh, he was uh, ranked uh, number one in all the information systems scholars across the globe in terms of his uh, publication records. And he has not done this for the first time. He has done this several times in past uh, several years. Uh, he also holds uh, senior editorial positions at uh, leading journals. Currently, he's serving at the Information Systems uh, Research and uh, the Journal of uh, Association for Information Systems, which is a flagship uh, IS journal. Uh, previously, I think uh, he served on the boards of MISQ as well as uh, Decision Sciences. Uh, with this, uh, I, will, uh, I will conclude this introduction. This, I, I wanted to keep it, keep it brief, but look up his profile very interesting uh, studies he does and very interesting insights he shares. So definitely look up. Uh, all, all to you, Jason. Thank you. Um, when you put it all together that way, it sounds like something, right? But I never set out to be something. I just like to ask interesting questions and study. And sometimes my studies are great and sometimes they're not. Today's study is one, it's the first time I'm presenting it. Uh, we just submitted it for review of management science. So any feedback you want to provide will be welcome. And if you tell me I'm wrong, that's okay. It, it doesn't bother me that much because it helps me figure out how to tell my story. So, so this study is, is interesting because it's my first dive into working with archival data. So SEC filings uh, and other sources since the 1990s. And in the 1990s, I was a policy studies PhD student. Um, I, I started out with a really strong interest in understanding how technology was going to transform the world before we knew digitization existed as a phenomenon. And I ended up changing to business because I, I took a seminar with Samba, and at the end of it, he said, you know, you're not really studying government, you're studying technology. And I thought, yeah, you're, you know, you're right. And then he said, and you can study what you're studying in a business school, have more freedom and maybe make a little bit more. And I found that compelling as a young person. Um, 
But the, re the reason I tell that story is this, is that when we think about research such as this, we have to think about the big picture. And, and policy studies really gave me the big picture for thinking about how did governance, decision-making, and leaders change the how, how organizations operated. And we don't think about that enough. Yes. We've talked about CIOs for years. We've talked about governance of IS for years. But what we really haven't looked at is how this rise of digital leaders uh, beyond the CIO, CISOs, digital privacy officers, chief digital officers, you pick your label. We have not done deep dives into this rising digital upper echelon interaction amongst different actors in it and the incentive systems that guide their behaviors. Okay. And this paper is one of my first cracks that starting to think about how the different incentive systems for digital executives vis-a-vis -vis other executives shape firm outcomes. So that's my big preface. It also comes out, actually, one of my good friends is a chief information security officer, which I think it's Dollar General in the States. It's a fortune, I think it's a fortune 150. Um, he manages like 20,000 people. When he took the position, uh, when I knew him, he was the, the chief information security officer for a university. And he got headhunted out because these guys are hard to find. And, uh, and I, I said to him, why are you taking it? He said, because they let me sit on the board of directors. And I thought, when I was a young guy, and I'm 50 now, but in my 20s, you would never have thought the chief information security officer, because security and privacy and data were so important, would sit on the board of directors of major corporations. So in part, the motivation also came out of that conversation, is we have rising numbers of digital upper echelons, right? people holding these roles, and then we also have a substantial influence of boards of directors being engaged in these questions. Sounds interesting. So I want to give a special thanks to my co-authors as I start this. UN ran the data. She helped us think through and conceptualize things. I wish she was here because she can answer the better the questions better than I can. Um, and so for the doctoral students, as you get a little bit more senior, your students often know more about the data than you do. And, and some people fake it better than others, and I will try to fake it for you today. Um, but Yilin is really special to me. She's my, my first student that's a quantum this nature, and she's she's very forgiving of an old guy. Uh, Dan Pienta is, uh, is also, was also my student at Clemson University. He was my last student there. Um, he's a former security professional. He was a principal in an IT security firm. And a lot of the thinking about this interplay of the dynamic between, uh, between CISOs and, and executives were based on some of his intuitions or observations in the field. And then John Darcy was actually the first, one of the first, if not the first graduate from Temple University's PhD program. And he just happened to be in the area. And one thing I like to do as I do my research is I like to build teams of people and combinations of people with interesting ideas and skill sets. And this is a really nice illustration of that. But really, they're all really nice people. And I, and I just want to acknowledge their contributions to the work. Okay. So this question of security breaches is increasingly impressing for firms. And when we started this work, the Ukraine war hadn't started. But when you think about what we've heard in the past month, Okay, rant, we're, we're, we're worried about cybersecurity threats coming in from Russia or other bad actors. Belarus, pick, or you know, Bilo, pick, pick your pick your pick your vector. The North Koreans, the Chinese, whichever person is seen as a potential threat to a Western country, okay, the, tra the traditional West or the global North. So this is an issue people are thinking about, and primarily where we start thinking about it, it's interesting. Because okay? you think about companies like Facebook that we know are attacked every day. They don't report the attacks. In fact, we had the breach a couple of years ago where they sat on a major breach or disclosure of all of our personal data for over two years. And they didn't tell us. Despite stated security policies or privacy policies saying they'll protect their data. And Facebook is low hanging fruit, right? We could all take a shot at Facebook or the company now known as Metaverse. Sort of like Prince back in the day, for those of you that remember Prince. When you think about every other major company, because this isn't just a Facebook issue, after the SolarWinds breach, y'all recall the SolarWinds breach? It's absolutely fascinating, right? The, the, the Russian operatives, we think, or we confirmed now, inserted malware essentially into upstream software, which got propagated throughout the ecosystem of virtually every major company operating in the United States and Europe. Okay. And we still don't know who. Breaches aren't being reported, which is a fascinating question. Ask, like, why aren't they reporting them? This shouldn't be rocket science. 
right? You, you have someone that sits down, you know this, you know the vector your software came from. There's a breach upstream or there's a breach nearby. You go into the into the dark web, i.e., places that are hard to find, like it's not really dark, and, and you can actually find your customer data. Okay. So why aren't they being reported? And if you go to the Wall Street Journal, Shumsky, one of the one of the, the writers there, says, you know, they're, they're getting hacked more frequently. They aren't just burning, they're just closing them, and it's upsetting investors. And from at least the perspective of using archival data, this is a rich moment, right? Saying, okay, so what are the implications of uncertainty of knowing or not knowing about breaches or our valuation of firms? And what the Wall Street Journal would suggest. And what the SEC would confirm by its behaviors is the challenge is that the damage isn't considered material. And the SEC requires reporting material things when what you're doing, what occurs, that damages stock market valuation or, or, what, or the firm's ability to perform and deliver, deliver, deliver profit, which is kind of interesting because what it would suggest is because there's this permeability that we don't yet know how to value or think about the nature of breaches, other than the sense of violation on the customer side. Interesting yet? So just sorry to yeah, no, please. So it, it almost feels like if you report a breach, mm -hmm. then it might become material. That's uh, right. So so and that's some of the logic we're going to try to get into with this paper is is we think that's that is the concern of of, of non IT executives. Non-IT non -IT executives compensation systems, you, you jumped me, jump me ahead 30 slides, but the non-IT non, non executives compensation is typically tied to stock market performance, right? It, it, and, it, and, it was, and this was a great innovation of the 80s, right, was to say, hey, if the firm's doing well and, and, and stock market's a proxy for it, we'll give you options and we'll, and we'll let you vest early, right? We vest early and often. And so the fear is we're not going to disclose because we make it material, which accepts, it accepts the valuation of the firm and lowers executive compensation. So executive compensation strategies incentivize not reporting, which is interesting. Okay. So the US security, the, the SEC in the States, again, since I'm based in the States, this is going to be my metaphor and I apologize in advance. <laughs> But the SEC in the States has actually become increasingly con concerned about this, but they haven't provided clear guidance today. In 2011, they issued some disclosure guidance saying, no, this is, this is what a breach looks like. If it's a material event, it's, it's one that any reasonable investor would consider important to the investment decision. Okay. So what does a reasonable investor worry about? Say Facebook, okay. again, the company formerly known as Metaverse. It, Facebook only has one asset, customer data. One would think a major breach of customer data, their, their only asset, we could argue other things they have, but the, the, the core crown jewel of their ecosystem, that would be material. In 2018, because they had not, they had not explained this very well or given a timeline for reporting the breach, the SEC issued another guidelines that emphasized timeliness. We should be reporting things quickly when the breach occurs which is also quite reasonable and consistent with GDPR guidelines, right? If something happens, we tell people, sure. If a corporate lawyer can argue that it's not material in the courts, and then the company can choose not to disclose that, mm -hmm. basically that can you prove it in court? And if they can... I completely do not disagree with you. Okay. The, and, and the challenge with that, if we, if we take a legalistic approach, of, of does it meet the bar for being material in court, is it doesn't meet A, the, 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 the approach of how your customers who actually buy your products are, are, are handling things, right? And, and we want materials, we want material breaches to be reported not just for investors, but you also want it because stakeholders who accept the, the impact of the long-term success of the firm, they, they're bothered by these breaches. Okay? So, so the, the court standards you're giving is a good one. Okay, excuse me. And then the other piece is, which court are you going to talk about? And if you go to the states, at least with a patchwork of fifty different states with competing, but that's competing rules. Generally so registered in Delaware, right? Most of the companies. Many of them are listed in Delaware. Yeah. So, but even then, now if we're if we're going to if we're going to take your approach, okay, um, this is not a question I expected, by the way. Um, so thank you, because um, we may be getting this from a reviewer. The, the challenge then is if we take it to court, right, and we're going to litigate it. Now we're talking about multiple years 
to disclosure. Ultimately, what will happen is an out of court settlement. That is what generally happens. You get a billion dollars fine or less, and then it would. I do not disagree with you, but I'm not worried about litigation today. I'm worried about understanding why executives choose to make that decision. One plausible explanation is it's a, it's a fuzzy legal standard, which I think is what you're pointing to. And it's easier to pay out an out of court settlement than to report and then get immediate hit right there and then on your paycheck. But, but what we know about security breaches is customers vote with their feet. And when customers hear years later that their data was stolen, okay, it's not a comfortable moment for you as a customer. But Experian is doing just fine. I'm giving you an counter example. I, it, Experian is doing just fine because it's not a plausible alternative to Experian. We have five different agencies in the states, right, that handle this. And Experian, Experian when actually when their breach occurred, if you go back and look at it, CEO got let go, chief information security officer got let go. There was tremendous turnover at the top, and there, there was actually a loss of credibility for the organization. And I would argue, and I haven't gone back and looked at this, but based on the emails I received from people soliciting me who subscribe to their services, we've also seen a proliferation of alternative services the past five years. So from a strategic point of view, I would argue is despite the legal piece, despite it only costing a million bucks or two or 50, okay, it's still an issue that would be of concern to an executive. Sure. I'm just wondering about unintended consequences tightening up all these reporting rules and obligations mm -hmm. which the companies will stop doing. Because very, as you said, some, some of these uh, attacks are very uh, subtle, mm -hmm. and if you don't look, you're not going to see. So then you're not going to be, you'll be clear in front of the cops. So we're deliberately turning a blind eye at the executive yeah. level, which is interesting because the SEC, as I'll, I'll mention, they're well aware of that, that possibility, mm -hmm. and they're reframing the rules around reporting to hold board members accountable as well as executives, which, which is an interesting thing, right? But I'm also interested at the operational level. I mean, if, if these companies mm -hmm. will have monitoring centers and all the rest of it, then maybe they, they're not so, uh, maybe they'll be discouraged to invest in uh, cut, cutting edge security solution, uh, intrusion detection solution, because if they see they have to report it. That's a really good question I have not given a lot of thought to. I think we're going to hear that a lot today suddenly. Um, I. I think I'm going to actually have to call some people and ask that question because because I mean, the interviews that we did with CISOs is in anticipation of doing the study. It was it was pretty clear that they're very fixated on securing the firm perimeter and keeping data within the firm and keeping other people out. And you don't ever hear them talk about fear of getting in trouble. And in fact, what's really interesting when you when you sit down and talk to CISOs in this context, you'll find uh, CISOs in a very competitive industry like financial services actually collaborating across firms. And we don't normally see big banks collaborate. Right? They, they tend to be hyper competitive with one another. But when it comes to security, they actually pull resources and, and other, other things because they see themselves as if one bank is a weak link in the chain, all of them. So, so I don't, my intuition is I see your point. But the limited evidence I've gleaned that would be related to that right, from talking to people, not from actually doing quantitative data analysis, would suggest the opposite occurs. That's good to hear. Yeah, it's, 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 when you talk to these CISOs, they're actually really fascinating people because they often think they're elite. They see themselves as distinct from the IT function. They see themselves as, as shepherds of the, of the flock, so to speak. Um, and they see themselves in opposition often to the chief data privacy officer or to the CIO because they're in a monitoring role over CIOs, and then the chief data privacy officer is in a monitoring role over them, or tells them they can't do certain things. So it's a really fascinating world I'm starting to enter in, in these conversations. Questions? I'm doing really well if I could slide off. Okay. So what's interesting with this, and, and, and again, these things remain, remain uh, somewhat, somewhat um, murky. In terms of losses, here's an illustration from 2019 where they charged, uh, was it Altava? 35 million for failing to disclose a 2014 cyber breach. So there is a financial penalty, even though when you scale it over time and it gets the, the, the volume of sales, it's not that bad, as, as you pointed out. Okay. What we also see here is, that, is direction from the SEC 
saying that directors and officers of the firm have an obligation to report. Um, however, there's still, there's still at this point in time, there, there were no, uh, no explicit disclosure, disclosure requirements and companies have to elect or opt in to disclose it in an official filing. They have to deem it material. Um, what we also know from looking at, looking at different breaches is that again, when these things occur, people lose their jobs. So, they're, so they are salient in the mind of, of executives. Despite the SEC's guidance, many firms choose not to disclose breaches or they do like such notifications. And we know this because they report it in the popular press, okay? but they do not put it in formal filings, which is sort of interesting. And, and the reason that they're doing it is they're speaking to the stakeholders, the customers, because they don't really want to keep people around. But if they report it to the SEC, they go under a microscope, which is not comfortable. And from, from, from between 2005 and 2017, uh, per, report, per, per, per public reporting report, um, there, there was an average of nearly three weeks between the discovery of the breach okay, and the actual reporting, which is interesting and there are lots of plausible explanations for this. Is one, we need to identify the source of the breach. Two, we need to have a remedy. Typically, when you hear there's a breach, you want to hear it's been fixed. Okay? And sometimes that can be tricky. So one would not expect there to be a there, there to be um, a, report, a discovery of the breach and report to be tightly correlated in terms of one day, but three weeks is a very long time in the world to move data, okay. it's a, and it's a really long time to have people poking around inside your organization. Okay. And and it, and the argument we would make, and the SEC would would would, would contend as well, is that because this affects when they're released uh, valuation of the firm. This is something that investors should know. And there's a secondary concern because executives have known for three weeks. In the following three weeks, they and their board members may engage in insider trading in anticipation of the inevitable fall that's going to come. So those are monitoring problems. So why is it so long? Okay. The, first, the first reason why it's so long is that the decision of what is material is with the breached firm. Okay. There isn't a clear legal rubric, sure, Juliana. I wonder um, how UGDPR affects this because UGDPR basically has the um, legal requirements for firm when there is a breach to report this within a certain uh, period of time. I think 48 hours after they know there is a breach. And this is probably also for firms who are not in EU but who has users. In the EU, yeah, yeah. Um, that's a question that I should be prepared to answer, but I'm not prepared to answer. And that's really an empirical question that, it, that would be really fun to gather a data set around just to, to see if the, to, to, to do it, to do a, to do first a DID type study, which is our magic word these days, right? Uh, to, to run basically a natural field experiment to see whether, whether, whether breach times or breach reporting shortened after GDPR. But the other question, which I think is the more interesting one, because that would be obvious, right? There's now a clearly stated legal standard here, at least for, for when you have to report. But what would be interesting to see is the level of engagement of a company in Europe versus not. And I would argue the American companies are probably being pretty weasley. You know, and because we because they, they, they don't have the same set of implications. Yeah. Uh, and, and that would be interesting to find out. I'm not sure if I would call that an IS paper or a strategy paper or a legal studies paper, but it would be really interesting to know the answer to that question. Okay. So if you go back to Facebook, right? And if this is, this is the assessment is on materiality, okay? If you look at this, okay, Facebook ended up paying $100 million because of that breach, which is a substantial chunk of change, even to somebody like Mark Zuckerberg. Okay. And the reason they did it was they, they felt like that they had misused data for a period of years and years and did not disclose it to customers. Okay. So, so, they're, so they're actually being held accountable. Okay. If you come forward okay, to other places such as SolarWinds, what's really interesting here, okay, the SolarWinds breach was pervasive, affected virtually every company in the United States, including higher education. Okay. And the SEC is actually now saying, you need to tell people. This was a large enough breach, everybody should be informed. And yet companies aren't announcing whether they're affected. Still. Okay. So reasons. 
start team has, has sat around and batted around ideas on a call for over a year about this. So why wouldn't they? One is the decision's complex, right? Competing legal frameworks, was it really a big deal? Uh, what time did we disclose it and, and whatnot? Okay. You know, and so on the one hand, as they're dealing with this complexity, they have this threat of SEC enforcement and reputational damages. And that should be enough, we are, we'd argue, if, if you're a rational person to say, okay, let's just report it and get the pain over with. Okay. But on the other hand, okay, you have a bigger problem. If you report the breach, it may be symptomatic that our firm just really isn't very good at protecting data. And if data is a competitive advantage of firms, what does that suggest to you? Is the firm is not a viable steward of data or possibly competitive over time. Again, with the Facebook illustration, if Facebook can't provide to protect our data, people become deeply, uh, become much less likely to continue to give it data. Now they've got other issues, right? But if you felt like that you're uploading your picture of your new baby, and there's going to be a breach and that baby's image is going to be shared with people you don't want it to be, you're not going to upload it. So, so th there should be some, so there should, by, by disclosing, you may impact people's willingness to share information, which then affects viability in the long term. Some would argue as well, and this is another raging conversation over multiple coffees, okay, uh, was really, you know, you know, we'd expect it to be slow because firms are slow, which I think is a, a plausible argument. And the argument there really is when you think about notification decisions, okay, you have multiple executives involved. You have the CEO, you have the CFO, you have the chief legal officer that gets involved. Right? Because they have to help craft it. And, and, when, and as they sit and they talk about these things, actually there are probably different priorities and professional goals in play. So if you're like avid systems of professions, it's really transparent. Each of us is trained in a different way to think about different things. Okay? Uh, you, you can think about as you walk around your business school, the different motivations and the different, different postures each of us takes on research. Okay? Translate that to executives and they're equally bright, maybe brighter than us because they got out of that. And so they're, they're, they sit in the room and they argue and they go, you know, maybe we should do it this way, maybe we should do it that way. And particularly, we would argue, when you think about executives at digital roles, our focus on organizations is quite different because we look at operations. If you think about our research in IS, right? Mostly we're looking at how do we create challenges for people? How do we resolve challenges for people? And how do we make people ultimately more effective in what they do? That's operations. Some of us study strategy, but really we're interested in, in ensuring more effective operations. It's an efficiency perspective or an effectiveness perspective, even if we're looking at the dark side of technologies, I would contend. And yes, I'm a straight up positivist, okay, um, which is interesting in and of itself. The other piece here, okay, with executives, they're interested in valuation because they're incentive schemes. They're interested in being stewards, and we talk a lot about stewardship theories of firms and management. They're interested in being stewards for the stakeholders who own the firm. So it's two different logics in play. One is keep the lights on, keep things moving. The other is what's the firm worth for the people who I'm a steward for? And if you dig deeper into thinking about this and you look at, you look at IT executives in terms of providing inputs, most IT professionals, when you talk about them and you go out and you read like Guzman's work on the nature of IT work, we have a very fixed attitude. Consider DevOps. Do we need to study DevOps? Like DevOps is all about ensuring operations stay up, right? They're not strategically thinking, they're proactively responding in between major rollouts and pieces of software. They're independently responding to solve problems, minimizing tickets and problem resolution. And it's pervasive in our industry. Okay? When, you look at, when you look at CIOs, they're really interested in making sure information keeps moving. Have any of you sat down and talked to a CIO recently? Beyond security, their number one interest is, does the network stay alive, right? I mean, we're somewhat pragmatic. If the network doesn't work, your, 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 your phone burns up. Right? And most CIOs I know have to keep their phones on at night in case something goes down so that they can get up and get their team moving and address it. Okay, so we're really operation centric. And if you look at CIOs and CISOs, a lot of their compensation packages are written around uptime. It's so minimizing the, the, the number of data breaches, minimizing the impact of data breaches and operations, 
and having a service level a group, service level type agreement of everything's working accurately and effectively 90, 95, 99 percent of the time. So they're really focused. Right? And the assumptions when you go out and actually talk to the CISOs, okay, is they're all they they all share information. And it's really interesting because they sit in this very strategic, hyper competitive space. But if there's a breach at, say, TD Bank in the States, they contact HSBC and they say, This is what happened. And they fully disclose it with one another because of their dealing with interlocking problems. Sort of interesting. I thought to me, this was like eye opening. It's like maybe it seems, seems obvious, right? But from our point of view, for these reasons, we think that IT executives would say, hey, just report it. Get it over so we can get it back to work. This is our operation centrics. In contrast, non-IT executives, particularly CEOs and CFOs, who actually deal with the SEC and are well aware of the impact of SEC filings because they're used to dealing with the external environment, okay, and they're navigating complex turbulence environments, they have this longer-term business outlook. And typically what they're concerned about are long-term viability, Will we survive the next 24 months or 25 or get to pick your time window? And they're concerned about firm reputation. And if you take a, take a gander at SMJ, right, corporate social responsibility, green policies, fake green policies, you know, performing, performing things in good faith, if all of these things are rich in that literature right now because reputation drives firm, firm success over time. So our assumption here, Okay, that is that non-IT executives would have a different position. They would typically want either delayed or no reporting at all. Because when it hits the SEC, then it gets propagated by consultants and by, by analysts throughout the throughout the, 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 uh, the, the financial markets, and, it, and then you, you, you take a hit. And then some also suggest. The issue, and this is a classic IS explanation, is executives and firms aren't making decisions or providing information because they simply don't know. Sure. Uh, you classified board of members into IT and non-IT, right? I'm about to. Huh? I'm about to. Yeah. What have you considered if the company is an IT firm to begin with? And like for instance, Google. So we control for that. We, we control for industry okay. in the analysis, which would make sense, right? Um, because because even though they're, they're, the, the logic would actually still apply of the, something being operations centric versus strategic, even in an IT firm. Now, now I would expect I would expect the, in an IT firm, the, exec, the, the, the executive side to be more aware of the operational issues. Yes. I, I'm not going to dispute that with you, but the different incentive schemes are still there. Okay. I would argue. Sure. So probably it's, uh, it's already in the embeds, but uh, if not, you might want to consider the, the background of the executives. Mm -hmm. uh, because I have seen some studies uh, talking about, I mean, their role is one thing, but where they're coming from, what they've been mm -hmm. doing in the past, those things might also influence so somebody, for example, played a CIO and now he's a CEO. Yep. Uh, it, it might. Uh, yeah. The, the, those. So, so two observations. One, I agree. Two, there are not very many CIOs that become CEO, CEOs, right? We, we seem to top out at the CIO level, which is a real problem in our industry. Because because what it does is it means like lots of smart kids that want to lead companies don't go into IT, right? Because 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 they don't want to feel cap. But but I but I do not disagree. The the, the influence of background is something I'll I'll trip, trip my way into here in a second, particularly for board members. To your point, is is an important piece of our consideration in this, in this study. Okay, and and the notification. So so we have this issue is access to knowledge. Okay, and it, and the notification decision we think sure. Sorry, no, you're you fine. Out, I, I was just thinking about the different industries, and mm -hmm. I keep thinking about financial services. What's going on here? Um, so I think data breaches, they can be quite different in terms of the materiality and what mm -hmm. happens, like if somebody steals a lot of data from Facebook, maybe yeah. Facebook can afford not saying anything for a few years because, you know, sharing some pictures on the web for people or somebody else having access to these data, perhaps uh -huh. maybe, 
kind of go unnoticed, but in, in finance, like if somebody gets your login credentials, for example, overnight, you may see that your account is empty. Mm -hmm. It's pretty different impact. So, so I was I'm just wondering, discloses in finance, to my experience, you know, reported for the BFSA at least here in the UK, and we had checked cases where Tesco Bank, for example, was hacked mm -hmm. a few years ago. I mean, they had to disclose immediately mm -hmm. because also, let the accounts for empty. Well, the, the real world impact is, is huge, right? So, so, so the stakes of the game to the customer, you're right, is, is something that would affect it. However, I don't think we considered that in the analysis. We, we controlled for industry, but we didn't explicitly ask the question of did, was financial services different from everyone else? And I think that's a good point for me to take away back to my team. Yeah. So, so notifications that, so this is where we get to the work, where notifications that decisions are influenced by who monitors executives. And typically we think about boards of directors. And we have lots of evidence that boards of directors do pay attention to this uh, in, in, the, in the practitioner literature as well as in the, in the academic literature. And it's kind of interesting, okay? Because when we talk about boards of directors, uh, what, what becomes interesting here, and this is according to Gartner, if you all read Gartner here, they're a little bit of a rat, right? However, they're pretty good for helping you think through problem identification. Their solutions aren't always the best. But what's interesting, Gartner suggests and what the SEC has stated is that boards should actually have the actively monitoring cybersecurity risk now, which is a huge contrast to 2011. So, so this is becoming part of the fiduciary and the, the legal responsibility of boards. And so what we see is an integration occurring of having people with expertise on boards around cybersecurity. Now that prescription has been advanced without anyone testing whether it actually helps. And so we, we do look at that in this paper. Okay. So how do we manage executives to get them to do what we want? I keep coming back to compensation, but pretty much the truth of it is, it is pay. Okay. The, the, the remedy that's typically used in most, in most of the literature is we manage incentives. Okay. And, and, we, and we, we offer compensation that's tied to, to having events occur or not occur. In this particular case, we'd argue, I would argue the compensation should be higher for a CISO if there are fewer and fewer breaches or if, they, or if they navigate it more quickly. So what we looked at in the paper is our, is our independent variable of interest is executive compensation and, and the way that they, the compensation packages work for, for, uh, for uh, in general, for CISOs and CIOs versus, versus regular executives. Okay. And there are three theories that are directly relevant to this. So finally, we get to theory versus description. The first theory is a classic agency theory, right? Okay. When agency theory simply says that people are self-interested and we have to do something such as compensation schemes in order to think about, about how to align incentives. Now, in this case, we have, what we also have going on is the SEC is offering criminal reasons, right? Or, or other penalties take for, for, for notification. Okay. And these changes are changes in incentive schemes to get people to, to, uh, to, to report information. When you think about this because of self-interest, okay, the behavioral theory of the firm starts offering some nuance. Okay? And what the behavioral theory of the firm would argue, so here we argue incentive systems are important. Here we argue is a, executives engage in satisfying behavior, which lets them meet the rubrics that they have consistent with their incentive systems. But we would argue is there are different coalitions within our firm, okay, which is a BTOF essentially argues, which helps us, which, which shapes how decisions are made and outcomes which makes salient this question of digital versus non-digital executives in a very broad sense, or specifically CISOs versus other people. And then when you think about our incentive piece, it's kind of interesting here, as we would argue that the incentives, the incentive schemes result in all kinds of different outcomes. And we're seeing evidence of that in which incentives support executives acting in ways that are self-serving, which actually don't align well with the long-term interests of firms. If there is a plausible and I think reasonable critique of executive compensation being tied to stock market performance. Because stock market performance, and you're the FinTech guy, right? It's highly variable. And executives take lots of positions and delay reporting lots of things until, until the end of the quarter. Because they don't, because because people don't pay don't pay as much attention okay, to uh, to things that happen right after the end of the quarter. It's the end of the quarter reports or the annual reports are what shape how people how the market responds. Okay. And there's a really interesting paper that's forthcoming at uh, Management Science by Sebastian Schutz and Jens Federer. Uh, some of you might have seen it, where they went and they scraped 
all the news reports occurring and they mapped it to data breach reports. On our intensive news days, they found firms were strategically dropping news of breaches, which is kind of interesting, right? So, so we know based on that paper, just gleaning it from that evidence, okay, and, it, and it just became forthcoming. So I'd email one of those guys and they'll give you a copy of it. Um, that incentives are making a difference and executives are making decisions based on, are based on when they report these things. So we have some evidence. So how do incentives impact reporting data breaches is an important question from, in our mind. And it leads us to our research questions of do, 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 does IT executives and non-IT executives influence SEC data breach notification rules? Which feels really simple against this rich backdrop, but that's the nature of this data. And that's the nature of this genre of research is you, you overly simplify it, I will own that. Now we add nuance to this because we're interested, uh, we're, we add nuance to this and we, we come up with a few specific hypotheses, which I will not revisit because we'll probably run out of time um, uh, in, in great detail. But the, so we hypothesize that the higher executive IT compensation, there'll be fewer delays because they're rewarded for operational efficiencies, it, essentially. And, and our second hypothesis, when, the, when, when, when IT, non-IT executives make more, Delays will be longer okay. because their interest is, 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 pervert, is, is pervert, preserving that valuation. Okay. We also predict okay, this information. And we ask the question does board cybersecurity intensity, the instrument that the SEC has suggested to, to govern, doesn't really have an impact? And in my mind, this is the interesting piece of the paper. Because it's an old policy guy that studied interest group politics in the 90s, of course, competing interests make a difference. Like, and it's nice to empirically show it, but this question of, of whether the knowledge on the board and filling knowledge gaps, whether that affects reporting, is really interesting. Okay, because that's the, the state of the role of boards, right? It's to bring access and knowledge and ideas to bear on problems that might not otherwise be present. And it's quite rational for the SEC to take the posture of we have a breach. How did you handle the breach? You had no cybersecurity expertise in your board, so of course you didn't handle it well. Okay. So our third and fourth hypotheses are board cybersecurity intensity moderates the relationship between IT and non-IT executives. And by board cybersecurity intensity, what we're interested in here okay, is whether the board members have cyber, cyber backgrounds or have they, are, are they our boards of interlocking firms, okay, because, because boards typically interlock at some level, Okay, that have had, had experience with breaches as well. So you may have functional expertise or training expertise or, or applied experience. Either way, okay, you have a degree of intensity of cybersecurity knowledge on that board. Plausible? I'm waiting for my question. No? Sure. I mean, I was gonna ask, how do you measure that exactly? <laughs> so, 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 we, so we actually went and scraped, the, scraped LinkedIn we scraped, we, we scraped different posts. We actually went and, and looked through it, and, I, and I'll show you in a second the different places. We went to exec comp, uh, exec comp and Bordex and pulled backgrounds. So, so, so we, 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 we took it from reported data found in the real world, not from actually talking to people, which is not perfect, but it's not terrible either. So it's a good faith effort. Sure. Just board, could you go back to that slide? Board cybersecurity. Intensity. Mm -hmm. If I include network relationships with formal and informal policing services, no. So the police, the police are not considered at all in your scope. No. I I don't know how we would tackle that question because typically one doesn't put into your bio that I hang out with the FBI, <laughs> and I'm not being facetious. I just don't know how I would catch that because that's a really good question that, that we probably would have to go into some interviews with boards. And, and I know Tony Vance at Virginia Tech is doing that right now on this topic and, and ask those questions of, okay, so where do you get your information from? I do know when in conversations with people in this industry, they pay attention to the FBI. And one of our team members works with the FBI on, on related issues. But in terms of quantifying that in a consistent, replicable manner across organizations, that's really a tough one. Because people, because if you signal to people I'm, I'm interacting with law enforcement, the immediate question is, what did you do wrong? 
So, so there's an incentive to not disclose that. Now, we could also make the case that, that, that it's say, no, I'm doing everything right. Well, as, as a thief, I might be less prone to um, attacking a particular organization if I knew the cybersecurity director mm -hmm. was well networked. He's ex FBI or he's ex Israeli uh, trained security expert mm -hmm. with links to private companies. Yeah, we have, we have, I have another paper, not this one, that's, that's just nascent, where we're looking at, looking at a looking at the background of the CISO and where they acquired their training, and if they have a military background versus non-military, because a lot of the security professionals in the States actually come from the armed services, because yeah, yeah. they're brought up that way. And we do find that that has, that has an impact on, uh, on, on breaches. I think we found they had an impact on breaches, but it was also interesting. It had an impact on, on the innovation climate in the organization. And people with a military background CISO actually filed more patents. Now, it's a chicken and egg question. I don't know which came first. But it's an interesting, interesting observation that, that to me suggests it'd be interesting to go dive into. So your question's a great one. I just I can't think of how I would quantify that consistently for the kind of panel data we construct. There could be there could be something in the normal non-market strategy literature uh, which might have some uh, I don't know. Yeah, the hard the hard part is getting it over time, right? Is is getting it across right. across a seven year span, fifteen hundred firms. Those informal contacts, but you, but you could argue that, that once it happens, you create a variable and just leave it in there and, and let it run from that point forward with the assumption that the relationship persists. I don't know how a reviewer would respond to that. A reviewer or two is out there. Some of the DMD papers they talked about who whom the executives play golf is then they collect some of those data to identify informal networks. So that would be yeah. Uh, the only challenge then is because the, the data collection becomes even more complex yeah. and UN needs to graduate. And you don't need this uh, unless the review is fast. So well uh, no, no. So, so so you know there are things we do for the reviewers and then we do things because we need answers. And some of the questions you're posing we really need answers to, right? Um but but there, there is that time component. There's only so many hours in a day, and students run out of funding to finish. Sure. Can I add to this conversation? Of course. Uh, there is a data set called Vortex, uh, which collect information in a detail for directors. Yes. And it will keep the past employment, mm -hmm. the different type of uh, communities that directors yes. belong. Um, and different activities, education of them, and this type of details generally. Um, so uh, I don't know that much about the cyber uh, security part of it, but in relation to uh, financial performance, uh, there are studies that they put into the social network, uh, yeah. past uh, network, current network, education, and so on. Absolutely. And uh, uh, based on the social capital yeah. um, theory, they try to bring this uh, and merge it with the yeah. study. And, and we and we use Bordex in this paper. Yeah. So you're, I, I completely agree with you, and I'm glad you're validating my experience. <laughs> um, no, no, no argument. But it, but Bordex doesn't tap into his question on relationships to the police. No, no, that, that part is quite. Uh, that, that, that's a really interesting yeah, so, question, yeah. actually, because yeah. it would be really interesting to see, it, and we'd have to get data on our number of attacks. It would be interesting to see if if if, if, if cyber criminals were sophisticated enough to pay attention to know. That, that experience was resident in the firm and whether whether there were firms that they avoided going after because they were better protected than others yeah. that would be a really interesting question sure my question regarding how dynamics within the organization play a role so my experience in economic saying that the last one to know about the data breach mm -hmm. was the it the head of the it Mm -hmm. So it was something that we could downplay or cover mm -hmm. just because we were afraid of the discussions or the, the results out of what happened, what how this would influence our job, and then how we decide between us how important it is, how we justify how important is this data breach mm -hmm. versus the consequence of this would happen if we notify our customers, etc. So mm -hmm. how does this work within the organization? So I would take off my positivist quantitative person hat 
and I would put on my original critical theory hat from my undergraduate years, and I would go walk around an organization to answer that question. Getting into the conversations that occur on this, on, inside the C-suite, I can give you abstractions, but really actually answering what you want to know takes talking to people, which is a, the limitation of the method. So I, I actually think what we need to see more of the conversation going on between papers like this and, and the other side, because you know, each, each, each group, most of you are aware, look at the other side as the dark side of the forest, right? But really it's complementary work and we're not doing enough of that. You know? And it's, it's, it's really interesting because like if you go to, um, there's a, an IFIP group that does cybersecurity, the Dukotawal Guru, da, 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 da. almost no, no qualitative and interpretive people show up to the conference. None. Which, is a, which to me means they're missing half the party. That's not an attack on them. It's, it's how we're constructing what we do. Okay, so method. And I have 66 slides and I'm actually timed about right. So we're good. Okay, so in terms of method, what we did is we constructed a panel data set from 2008 to 2020. So it does capture the cut over to GDPR, but we don't have a very long window since GDPR to look at. Okay. Um, we, we looked at publicly traded firms with data breaches. We used the privacy rights clearinghouse, the audit analytics and various community database to identify firms that had reported breaches. We found 769 unique firms with data breaches. So these are occurring. People are reporting them, okay? um, which, is, which is kind of interesting. And then we pulled the 8Ks. Okay, so we went and we went and pulled archival database from Edgar and we used audit analytics. And through a very long, laborious process, you went in a team of undergraduates, went through and, and manually fact checked each, each one to actually confirm okay, that there was an actual breach. Now, for the people that, that argue the positivist, research is easy, I would encourage you to take the time to read 768 8Ks or, or, or do those reviews. It's painful. Okay. And so, and we came out of it at the end after doing all of this, and we used the bag of words that were created by Darcy and Masoglu in their 2021 GIS. Um, we, we identified based on this 94 8Ks out of all those firms. So it's not that many. And this is the bag of words in case you're curious. This is actually, I think, when the reason I'm putting this on the screen in part is as a senior editor of the paper that was accepted for John Darcy. Um, our project was in play and I disclosed to, to the ESC that I was his co-author and whatnot. And she's like, well, can you be fair? And I was like, sure. And I gave them a bad time. John still gives me a bad time for giving him a bad time. But I think their keyword set is particularly helpful to feature and encourage people to go grab the paper if they're interested in doing this kind of work. Okay, because replicable keyword sets or, or one of the takeaways people don't think about with, with research. But in this one, we, we, we made, we've made them be transparent. So if anyone's interested in doing really good work, here's how you go and find your ATS. Okay, which just saved you six months of your life. Okay, final sample included uh, across our, our data sets. Uh, set, we had 17,020 firm quarter observation. We had 725 firms that were eligible to be pulled into our data set. So it's not a terrible data set. Okay. The numbers look really big, but remember it spans a 12 year window. Okay, in terms of, in terms of pulling variables for, for, for our data set, we use exec comp. Uh, we looked at realized compensations incentives and I can read the slide to you or I can, I'm happy to send them to you afterwards if you want to dig deep. Okay, we also use Vortex. Uh, particularly what we were interested in Vortex is we looked at uh, if individuals have the same affiliation, so that social informal component that was pointed out earlier. And we also looked at social connections to firms of people who had previously experienced a data breach. So either I was on the firm or I talked to have a friend who had, who had the who I could turn to who had some sort of data breach knowledge. So I had access. And then we then we pulled multiple of the multiple of the regular um, regular control variables with one exception. Uh, we used we used we we used Google to go and search and look for if there are unusual quantities or volumes of attention tied to a firm when they reported the breach. So, for example, when, when Metaverse screws up, we all go and get coffee the next day and talk about it, right? When Yahoo screwed up. Yeah, who cares? Yahoo's not cool. Uh, if, if Ford screws up, it's, just, it's a glitch. It doesn't continue. 
Okay. And so this let us use this as a proxy for getting at that, which, which was sort of helpful. Okay. The estimation approach, and again, I did not, sure. So where, where did the LinkedIn data come in? The LinkedIn data is another, is not in this particular one. This is in another study, so I misspoke. Oh, okay. and, and, if, and if hopefully we'll get some time to talk. Because I, I have a really interesting data set if you're, if you're interested in this kind of stuff. But, uh, that we, we use the LinkedIn data set and my other study where we're looking at innovation and CSOs. And, and what we did was we in, in that study, I know it's an aside and I apologize for the not interested people, but what we, we did in that study is we identified the executives that were involved in the firms of interest. And we actually went and looked at their backgrounds and, and did, did some confirmatory work because we weren't entirely comfortable using these different archival sources because their, their job profiles are changing all the time. And the people, and, and a lot of these databases are constructed by second and third parties or by self-reports which aren't entirely accurate. And, and what I would argue today, we're living in such a different world because now if you put lies on your LinkedIn profile and you get caught, huge reputational costs. LinkedIn is actually, I would argue, is, is even though we know it's done for impression management, the exterior world to a certain degree, says the person who he just told you, he just told you all to follow me on LinkedIn, which is weird, but um, but I think it's actually a pretty good data source for this kind of stuff. Yeah, because uh, we, we use board data actually. Okay. They might be assisted with trying to identify background of um, executives in investment in tech, for example, big innovation and patents. Uh, I could take us down a whole rabbit hole here that I would never finish the presentation. Yeah, no, we, 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 we could talk later. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, that's cool. Okay, so the estimation approach was a survival analysis. We use cost proportional, uh, pr proportional uh, hazard model. Uh, we use days uh, between the current date and the date that the firm has disclosed to experience a breach. Uh, for exposure measure, they were estimated in this way. This is Yiwen's competence. Unfortunately, the budget did not afford me the opportunity to bring her here to explain it in great detail. But if you want a Zoom call with her, I'll make her show up. Which is actually one of the really cool things about doing research today, right? Is, is if I can't answer it, I can actually have the person answer it directly for your questions. Okay, but it's appropriate because okay? we're interested in, in whether things are disclosed over, over a period of time. In terms of findings to, to skip, everything okay? Any questions during the intermission? I just had one sure. comment or question. Yeah. The beauty of the paper to me is the data that you have collected. And it's, I know it's very difficult. It really, I, so when I decided to try this archival research, I was so skeptical. I have to admit, like, I thought it was easy to do this. Oh, man, like, it is so hard. And, and I have a whole set of papers I, I intend to write our methods in the next two years on, on how to do this kind of research more, more efficiently. Like, for example, we should all be sharing our bags of words. Like that should just be an immediate reporting requirement now in every paper if you're going in and you're, you're searching through any kind of database. It should just be a routinely included appendix. You go scan our top journals, almost no one does it. Right? That because you can get more paper out of the data. Yeah, I don't care. That's, it, it, I should be able to replicate your results. If you're willing to stick your stuff in SMJ, MISQ, ISR, pick your journal, then I, you should be able to afford opportunities for me to at least approximate the analysis by going to the world and grabbing the data again. Because it's not a trivial effort to do those searches, right? If you really wanna know, okay. And, and it doesn't help for me to just give you the data, right? Because you don't know if I conducted the searches properly. It's, it's kind of interesting, right? Anyways, so this was much harder than I thought. You're, so I appreciate the comment and I'll pass that to you in because she has spent countless hours working on this as part of her dissertation. Well, it did have an economics a lot, right? Pardon? Some mm -hmm. of the top journals uh, in economics, they, they have a, a data set you can apply from, from uh, state and, and all the two files. Mm -hmm. yeah. And this is one of the puzzles I had when I switched disciplines. And, 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 and when I reflect back on, on my 30 year academic arc, was when I was in pol political science and policy, it was routine to share that information. And then I came to business and everybody treated it the way you just described it. It was a unique and imitable resource, right? And they, they all cited Barney saying, hey, no, don't give up your, your competitive mojo. Um, 
And I'm still puzzled why we're even having to have a conversation on what has been a norm in the social sciences for a hundred years. Yeah. Except psychology. Psychology has its own rat's nest of issues right now. Right? But it doesn't make sense. So anyways, yeah, I, I, I want to write a paper now on constructing and replicating bags of words. I think it would be interesting. Sure. I mean, I fully accept the, the, need, uh, the need for open research and open data and you know, exposure of this. Uh, I'm not going contrary to the GDPR uh, sort of regulation, especially when we have first responders in the survey. We know because the data, we, we can promise that the data is going, only going to be used for the purposes for which it was collected. So, so for the purposes of this paper, we are GDPR compliant because yeah, these are publicly available data sets. We could have a second session today if you want to, and, and I would love to participate in a conversation with a bunch of people that live here versus you being abstractions in my mind at home around the implications of GDPR for data disclosure. Because I actually think it's really problematic if the data is, is, is individually identifiable. However, there is a literature, again, in social sciences on how to de-identify data. Okay. And it's hard to do with qualitative and, and mixed media data, okay. no, no question. But for survey data, lab experiments and things like that, we can do it. It's just our field hasn't reflected, in my field, some of you aren't by us, haven't reflected on how to do it. But, 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 okay, yeah, I take your point, mm -hmm. it is possible, but we have promised when we collected the data that the data would only be used to purposes of research mm -hmm. and uh, sometimes we even go deeper because of the European Union we have aspects for problems that they want to use for that specific purpose for which it was connected, which is my research in mm -hmm. this moment in time. And I think this is where okay it's not individual identifiable anymore, but it's still personal data. So, so, so this is where we actually need to have a congress or a workshop or a, a group of scholars to come together and, and come up with a new rubric what do we share with informants and participants in our research? Because that's the only solution to this. If we're going to have data transparency, then we need to inform our participants what data transparency means, right? And we are doing that very effectively right now. Because we also we also obliged to give the data. We, 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 I, I have written it more times than I can count. I will not share your data with anyone. I'm going to lock it up in a vault someplace. It's encrypted, triple, quadruple secret passwords and, and whatnot, and, and, and it will be disconnected from the internet and a vault in my office, and at the end of the study, we will destroy it. So if you ask me for my data from 2002 to 2012, most of it doesn't exist anymore, which was really uncomfortable with my background in political science to do, but that's what my IRB asked me to do. It was reasonable. And then today, with the, with the new data, data, uh, data transparency initiatives, I can't say that anymore. But I write my RB applications that I would data and encrypt it because I don't know what other script to use. Because we haven't educated IRBs or institutional review boards on what the realities of the research are doing. But again, if, if you want to write a proposal to do a workshop, I'd be happy to participate. But I but that's not a problem necessarily in this data set because it's publicly available information that was self-disclosed largely by firms and individuals. Which is a new competitive advantage, I guess, for people doing archival work. Okay, so in terms of findings, excuse me. So our first two findings, unsurprisingly, were supported. Okay, when oh, when IT executive compensation, the higher it was, the faster they disclosed, I, they had had shorter delays. However, in contrast, we had the competing tension, which I think is super interesting, even though obvious. When executives get paid more, they slow everything down. Which is really interesting when you start thinking about this in terms of the future of IS research on executives. Because what it means is all the people that are like, oh, CIOs are just another executive. Not true. We have different incentive systems in our industry, or for the audience which we must directly speak to. So we can't simply translate an appropriate knowledge about executives and say, this is how digital executives are going to work. And I would actually argue, if you want to have a couple of beers at some time, that each digital executive probably has a completely different set of incentive schemes based on professional backgrounds and priorities to which they're assigned. And this one, right, I think we're okay. But for other outcome variables, there are other questions to ask. Now, this is where it gets interesting. Board cybersecurity intensity, the mechanism the SEC is pointing to 
doesn't work. And actually, the more that they know about cyber, the slower stuff gets. And both for IT executives and non-IT executives. And that's wild. So we have the de facto, um, as an American, I'll say it, top regulatory agency in the world around securities and exchange filings, right? That is it pushed a prescription that's meant to shorten the gap and delays, which in fact slows everything down, which is really interesting. Questions? Sure. Yeah, I was just uh, wondering about the coefficient there, how much slower, like what is the magnitude of slowness compared to people who actually are not experts in this report? That's a really great question that I can't quantify for you off the top of my head, in part because of jet lag, um, but in part because I did not think about it. Um, it it's obviously a, the standard per unit change in a number of days. So it's, it's a, it could be days or weeks, which is really what you're asking, right? Yeah, How, I mean, I was yeah, just yeah. wondering what does the coefficient actually decide? What would be measured? It, it, what, the co what the coefficient is telling us is that there's a significant impact there. And it's a negative moderating impact, but it doesn't tell us how, how much the delay is. But what it, and what it's really just simply telling us, because we're not really thinking of it in terms of time, we're thinking of it in terms of that monitoring function, right? The monitoring function is not operating as intended. So I'm weaseling. But I'll get you the answer that you want later. Is that okay? <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I, I've learned over the years of presenting when you don't know something, just own it. <laughs> and on this particular case, I, I can't tell you that offhand. I should be able to. And I was just wondering qualitatively, mm -hmm. I mean, how do you explain that in the discussions? Is it like people who really know their stuff take longer to just so, so, so this is what response I think, or I, I think, yeah, I think that's exactly what's going on. Is is that what happens is initially when we have a breach. I think that I think here this logic makes total sense, right? And these guys, they just want to get to work and get it done. These guys are like, well, we've got to step back and reflect and be stewards for our stakeholders and whatnot. These guys, as they get more experience, what they recognize is that breaches are just part of daily operations, would be my argument. And so are we going to disrupt daily operations and, and put a lot of effort into this? Or do we just go, you know, the breach has occurred. We've plugged the hole. Get back to work and let's report this when we can. That to me, that's wisdom, right? Is, is they're not they're not responding with panic. They're not responding reflexively. They're actually taking the time to step back and think about the big picture. That would be my argument, which which makes total sense, right? It's got good face validity at least. But I haven't done interviews to back it up. You know, and since and since we went to management science, we didn't do interviews because they don't anything worth the spoken word they they run away from. Sure. I was thinking that this is for the H1 and H2. Mm -hmm. uh, is it the same set of firms contributing to the findings, or, or these are different? We firms? had to get all the data, it had to be the same set of firms. No, what I'm saying is the findings, the significance you are finding for H1, for example, uh -huh. uh, might be coming from out of 750 firms, might be coming from some 200 firms. Uh, and, and the significance of the other hypothesis might be so. What I'm saying is, they're saying there's a selection problem with the data. Uh, no, I, I'm not highlighting a problem. I'm suggesting there is another way to tackle this. Mm -hmm. You can think of relative compensation. Mm -hmm. So within the same organization, if if the IT executives compensation in, in ratio of the compensation of the other board board members, what is the ratio? If the ratio is higher or lower, currently I think what you are measuring is absolute compensation. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to say that you can also look at the relative compensation so that it will measure within from a test. So, so what you're suggesting is that the stakes of the game, that's really interesting. So so that would be, that would actually, independent of this, that would be an interesting TMT study of, look, of looking at the, the equitable distribution of compensation within TMTs because it and means, how that affects, affects reporting. It might speak about the relative power they might have. Uh, in order of making decisions about reporting its own other things. So that's a really interesting question in that, that is, is non-obvious. 
that I will keep thinking about. Because I can, I can see a, a, a set of studies in, in different contexts as you start exploring digital executives to see how voice is attributed. Right. And like, is it like, is like abstracted away from this, chief data privacy officers tend to be lawyers, lawyers tend to be good at squeezing money out of companies, whereas IT people aren't so much. It'd be really interesting to look at if compensation of those di of different digital roles affect the, their ability or their impact vis-a-vis -vis each other, not absolutes, affects their impact on firm decision-making about IT. So, so I have a hotshot CISO who's accepted, compensated above average, and we have a more secure firm because they're weighted more heavily, or is it a signal of, of a signal of firm's prioritization of security? Versus, versus I have a hotshot uh, chief data privacy officer, and they run the most secure firm in the book, right? Yeah, yeah that would be interesting. That'd be really interesting. I don't, have you seen a paper like that? I haven't seen it. Is anyone seen a paper? So, so now you know what you need to write. <laughs> I know someone with a data set. <laughs> for H3 and H4, mm -hmm. another thing I was thinking is, is it that this forms, uh, there could be some forms in your data set, mm -hmm. more vulnerable to the security risk compared to the other forms? And it's possible that those forms have seen, for example, more security incidents or they have designated post for CISO, mm -hmm. uh, and that's why their intensity would be higher. Mm -hmm. And but they are more vulnerable, and that's why they don't want to report all the incidents. So, so we, we would like to think that by, by by collecting the control variables, which I'll show you in a second, we can, we capture that. Okay. Okay. Um, but it, again, it's we would like to think just because I have a basic deep distrust of archival data because it is entered by humans who who do like to make their firms look better. It says the guy who comes from the school that has the only convicted past dean for misreporting data. In American history. There are limits, right? Okay. That's it. Sorry, it's just yeah, a quick, quick question. Um, and kind of looking at the other marbles. Mm -hmm. um, are these, do you see anything interesting in there? I mean, gender seems to be negatively correlated with some of that. Um, but also, there are. So, so men are less likely to report, right? Right, that, that's, what we're, that's what we're suggesting here. And I am not opening the rat's nest of gender. Okay? <laughs> um, I, I do not disagree with you. And there's a tremendous body of literature that shows women are better stewards of organizations than men. But every paper I've ever submitted with gender as an, as an interesting ex exogenous variable of interest, I have been slaughtered on. Yeah, it, it, because because now, and I'll, I'll criticize my gender here. Men think they know everything. No, you're not right. There's no evidence that a woman would be better, really, because there's like hundreds of reports in practice, and, and there's independent papers in various management outlets that show women take a different view. Right. Yeah. So, so yeah. So, so this is a great point. I would like. I, I would. I, I'm hoping a reviewer will give us permission to talk about it. Yeah. But I'm. I'm. But. I mean, it's in there. In the data. Data. Yeah. It's in. But you fight the fights that you can win, right? Not in the first and round. Maybe. Not in the first round. And, and really, we didn't set out to ask the question of gender. So it felt a little bit like harking to me if we'd gone, gone in post hoc and said, oh, you know. Now, what we might do if we make it through the first couple of rounds is insert as a direction for future research. We have this interesting finding with control variables. And, and, and this paper actually got me moving on writing a paper on control variables in the selection of them and whether we discuss them or not, because most of the time when I send out papers and I discuss the control variables, the reviewers send me a love note back saying, take that out. But there's actually in, in the research methods literature, there's a growing body or a growing consensus that we should talk about control variables if they have anomalous findings. And and this is this this one jumps right out at you, doesn't it? And the same, yeah, exactly. The same. I mean, R and D negatively negatively correlated. I mean, that's also. It, I know it's not super it's, significant, but, but it's super interesting, yeah. right? And 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 that's and that in part, uh, I have no explanation for that. Um, but it is an interesting finding, and and we are doing related research looking at R and D and security. But I'm not, I, I can only give that at a very high level because we're, we're still out there for analysis. We keep seeing to find issues with it. An MBA, sorry, the last question. Mm -hmm. MBA, what's, what's that? MBA. It just means whether you have an MBA or not. 
Okay. It's kind of worthless. <laughs> it's really interesting, actually. Right? You show this uh, paper to your students then. We, there's no effect. There, there are things that we don't talk about with the kids. Um, and yeah, but you know, this is just one domain, right? And so, so MBAs, if you think about it, does your MBA program offer a cybersecurity course that's required? Not sure. Maybe if maybe you do one case study, right? Like like in, and most of the time, like at least in my shop, we do the mayor's case and we show we show how mayors by not paying attention to cybersecurity, everything went to hell and back. And thank God for that one office in Africa that stored the data, which 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 is it's a fun it's a fun case because everybody gets excited to talk about it. But we don't really push cybersecurity as part of our curriculum, so I wouldn't expect MBA to be there. However, if you're going to talk about backgrounds and demography and blah 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 blah. MBA or not is an interesting thing. Um, and that's another side conversation. We do have on the MBA level, we do have a slide. We have an introductory uh, information systems course. <laughs> but we have like a couple of slides on this and uh, a Sony, like the Sony PlayStation. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So you do the Sony case? Yeah, yeah which is also a fun one, right? Because um, because most of them have played video games at some point, or, or, or in one form or another. So they, they, they can make with it. Okay, in terms of robustness checks, I'm running out of time. I know, I know, I, I, but I don't have a long tail into this paper. So we're almost, we're, I'm almost out of slides, I promise. Okay, in terms of robustness checks, our results show, show that we're, we were mostly robust. Uh, endogeneity, we worked out okay. Uh, we, we, we looked at whether, whether we looked at state level physics. Like state level variables, which one could argue could create a confound because executive compensation would vary. We did, we did that and we came out okay. So we felt pretty good about the analysis. You know, and again, if I had known this was like pushing a rock up a hill, I might not have written the paper. Uh, our robustness checks were also good. We use alternative compensation variables. We also use the Cox proportional hazard model to look at it. And you know, the core findings held, which is kind of cool because that doesn't happen as much as you think. Continuing to click, uh, it also worked out largely the same for our board, uh, slightly less good in model three for compensation per value. Okay, even more robustness checks because robustness checks are the name of the name of the game. I'm actually a little bit bitter because I don't find them interesting, but you have to report them and they reject you if you don't have them because they think you're stupid. And they're mostly consistent. And then we also did reverse causality checks because people always ask that question. And we found we were okay. It wasn't, it wasn't data breach disclosure driving compensation. It was compensation driving data breach. I do have another paper where we're actually looking at compensation and data breach disclosure. If you're interested, that we're running preliminary analysis right now. The initial findings would suggest that often CISOs and CIOs make more money after breaches. <laughs> So, so maybe they're incented to have breaches. I don't know. Um, but, but I think that's because they just, just demonstrated value would be the argument I would make. And then once you have that experience of how to respond, you become more valuable to competing firms. So it creates a new market for you, which is kind of cool. Okay, so what did we learn? Since I am down to seven minutes. Okay, first thing we show is that executive compensation does induce undesirable behavior in the domain of cybersecurity for non-IT executives. We are the white hats in IS. Okay. If you're a security person, you get the joke. Um, what, what this underscores is the importance of, of thinking about different priorities and goals of people involved in the strategic decision, especially when a satisfying, satisfying behavior might take place, which is, has been established in other domains. Okay, uh, We think bringing this into the domain of IS or in a very specific timely issue is really helpful. Okay. And we think it's a mistake to, 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 to ignore translational research, which in a sense this is. Okay. What does that mean? Okay. As, and what it means is, as all these digital roles I've alluded to today surface, we shouldn't treat them as a monolithic group. Okay. And I think that's a really important point. Okay. Because we are all in the business of training future executives. Okay. And we should take that into account as we train them, because we are the people that should be teaching them value systems around reporting. We should be teaching them value systems around data use, right? And we should really take some time in our courses to have more than a couple slides, because I, again, am equally guilty of this crime, to actually have conversations with the students to think about when you're put into these positions, okay, here's your responsibility, but here's the right way to act. And there's often a disconnect between the two. Okay. Um, are IT executives distinctive? This is an enduring IS question that dates back to 1976 in the first issue of MIS Quarterly. Yes. <laughs> 
I felt really good being able to say that for once definitively. Okay. Okay. And so in, in future work, okay, we need to start thinking about, since we've laid this baseline, are, are the priorities and goals that frame the decisions? Like to me, it would be really interesting to sit down and look at if, if, look at the, the, whether where the, the backgrounds of uh, the different backgrounds that frame the way that people form goals. One reason my, in my other paper we looked at military experience as a proxy for 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 backgrounds okay, is because people coming from the armed services are really different than traditional IT people. Okay. One of my PhD students was uh, the CIO of the U.S. U.S. Army Medical Corps. Uh, Absolutely fascinating guy. He started out as a as a as a as a normal guy working working the street. He was enlisted, worked his way to be an officer. Was paratrooper trained, busted up his knee, became an IT executive. Strangest story ever. Okay, but that military mindset and operating and working with him and training him completely different way of handling problems than my friend Kevin, who's who's on the board of the large company. Kevin's kind of like, well, you know, if people screw up, I give them a rubber chicken. Mark's like, I fire them. Okay. Yes, he, it's a really, so, so we need to think through these different backgrounds and these different goals, which again is confirmatory in a sense, but what's distinct is in IS, in, in, in technology, we actually have a far more heterogeneous set of backgrounds that come into, into this area than other, other functional professions. Okay. If you go and you walk the halls of Microsoft, there are an amazing number of humanists walking around. What does it tell us about governance? Okay. It, it debunks the idea that IT expertise in a board increases the speed of financial, of financial reporting. And we think that's actually a really interesting and important applied finding. Okay. This is some, these are findings that the SEC could use to inform creating future policies. So, so the question for them to probe as they think about this is, so we found that, that, that intensity slowed down decision makers, slowed down reporting. It, is it the specific kinds of kinds of experience? And then ask the question of why, because they're being prescriptive right now, or who should be on boards? It, maybe they're wrong. Okay, God forbid. Um, so, so this is an interesting finding. Okay, and what does it tell us about boards of directors? In a sense, we're not sure, because they're not functioning the way the theory would suggest they function, and that's not comfortable. Which is why we're not at SMJ. Okay. Because they have a fairly high paradigm of what boards mean. Okay. Management science is more of like, well, the data is interesting. Okay. So, so we made a strategic choice. And given that the SEC has encouraged firms to increase the cybersecurity experience of boards, given our findings, we actually think that cybersecurity, the SEC's objective maybe needs to think about different things on reporting and, and more effective informing investors about cybersecurity risk and asking for questions perhaps on the strategic posture of the firm towards cyber as opposed to composition of which we think is interesting. Okay. So in, in sum, almost to the minute, time for once, we just don't know okay, whether more digital experience amongst boards helps firms make better decisions, which kind of sucks, right? Because this is something that we've talked about for, for 100 years since the 70s is, if only we could have shared knowledge with top executives, will get better for IT business knowledge sharing. And it goes back to Bill King's initial strategy work, right? We've said, this has been our silver bullet. And what we found here is the silver bullet isn't doing what it's supposed to, which is kind of an interesting thing to probe and disentangle, okay? So I think there's much work to complete. I think that the findings are interesting. And of course I have to, because I'm your speaker. But if I were in the audience, I hope you would feel the same way. And it's just time to get to work. Thank you so much. I made the mistake when, when they hired me, they said you could pick your own email, and I just watched Guardians of the Galaxy. <laughs> and I thought they were going to say no, and now I'm stuck. <laughs> so, any questions? Sure. Um, so, I got a comment actually. Uh -huh. um, one of the recent, like, it's more related to my field than what I do. Mm -hmm. Um, so I came across the concept, like a relevant one, which is uh, ethical hacking. Mm -hmm. So it's mostly using like machine learning systems to detect if there are any like malicious activities of hacking before they happen. Yeah, white hacking. Yeah, white hacking, exactly. Well, like the question is like, can we, or how can we make trust those machines given their black boxes nature and this kind of um, event 
for example. You're asking a really interesting question that we as a discipline have not answered. Okay, because because when we when we when we put up unsupervised or semi-supervised machine learning algorithms into organizations and make them actors in social technical systems, you know, we don't know what the outcomes are going to be, right? Which I think is what you're asking yeah, me. Right. And that's the intuition you've reached. Yeah. Is so we we blindly apply a machine learning algorithm that flags him as a threat. He gets fired, but the reality might be that the algorithm is actually interacting with the computer and not the person. Right? And because the computer is assigned for him, it's actually a proxy variable, but you actually might be my criminal. Yeah, no, I, we, we, there's no good answer for that yet. I, I think that's, that's actually one of the, that's one of the reasons why when I go look at that IFIP workshop, and I was a speaker at it for the first time this last year, um, I looked around, it was a Zoom workshop. So I'm just clicking through and look at all the faces. I'm like, where are the qualitative people? They just weren't there. And so as a result, their theories are just kind of not as rich. Because I think that's a question that, that one could go to the data and really think through from, from multiple different perspectives and ask that question of when do we make secure, when do we have automated security tools become actors in social technical systems? What's the other? Yeah, I've got a, well, anyways, I've, I've working papers and everything. I've got some, some of my German friends are working on a paper where they look at um, where, where, where people defer or confer to bots decision rights. Um, and, and the outcomes of that. And it's actually pretty interesting how they evolve over time. Yeah, that got rejected, by the way. But it was a cool <laughs> paper. <laughs> so, any more questions? Sure. Uh, just a quick one about the incentive. Uh -huh. So, in, the, in this study, you looked at the data bridge, yeah. number of data bridges. I, I was just wondering if data bridge attempts play any role in this whole compensation package. That's a really great question. And I am not certain that there is a good archival source where firms are reporting the number of attempts. So this speaks to, to his question as well of, of this broader milieu surrounding cybersecurity. We just don't know. We, we, I, we, I, for example, I can tell you that there are hundreds and thousands of phishing attempts every year, right? And it's, and it's expanding exponentially and lots of hand waving. Um, I can't tell you how many actually pose legitimate threats to firms, but, but the argument that security folks have made, and I think it's a good one, is it only takes one yes to breach. So, 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 so when I, in my qualitative pre-phase to doing this study, we, we did interviews with 13 CISOs. And it was interesting. We had one CISO in an interview volunteer. We didn't ask the question, he said, uh, he, was, he was telling the story of how, how he interacts with the CEO. And the CEO came into his office one day and he said, and, and one of his staff members was sitting with him, he said, the CEO goes to me, he goes, how's it going? And he goes, I said, it was great. My staff member said, oh, we just beat this breach back. I got stuck in meetings for the next week talking about security. And there's a little bit of sleight of hand that's occurring that absent a breach, I don't think CISOs tell top executives how many attempts they've had on the firm. Because it, because it distracts them from actually doing the strategic work they're supposed to do versus worrying about operations inside their work unit. It was really interesting. I was just like, so your job is to be the steward for the firm in this space, but you're not telling him this? He's like, yeah, because it upset him. He was incited not to. It's interesting, right? Sure. I have a follow-up scoping question. Mm -hmm. Rising out of this. So you had this, all this pre-work to understand mm -hmm. the world and to yeah. contextualize all the rest of it. Is it part of the pipeline? How do you Absolutely it? not. Um, and, and the reason it's not is, is uh, it, it's actually, it's a, one, we're not done with the pre-work. Like, 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 I've been thinking about like, what am I doing with my last 10 years or, or 15 years in the business? And, and, and I, I really want to develop this notion of digital upper echelons. They need evangelists for it. And we're still figuring out what that means. And so that this pre-work in part is figuring out what that means. And what the CISOs have unlocked for us, because they have to talk to all the other digital people, they're helping us build a mental map of who's out there. So for example, before doing these interviews, we never envisioned that HR officers were digital officers in groups. Because we asked them who enforces the policies when a breach occurs. And, and again, the, the, the CISO when we're on this group Zoom call, it's four people in him. He starts laughing. He's like, HR fires some for me. So, so he has the decision rights, right? He's doing the work, but when it comes to enforcing, HR is actually the digital hand of the law. I never would have thought before that interview. Sure. 
So I want to add on, uh, on this one comment. So does data breaching probably leads to a more individualist approach to a firm or a more collective one? Because if somebody like HR only, let's say, enforces the law, should we care about individualistic purposes from a cultural perspective or a more collective one? So, so Matt Jensen, Ryan Wright, and Alexander Dukova in Oklahoma and Virginia have been writing, doing work for a four and a half, five years now on building human firewalls. And their argument is that the collectivist approach is the more effective approach to, to understanding um, to understanding how to do effective security in the firm. And, and the individual approach, if we're all just independent actors, it doesn't really help very well. And so, so I would argue, I don't know if I've answered directly your question, but if I were to make a normative assessment, I would I would be pulling for the, the collectivist approach. I think it's more effective if our, if our colleagues are doing it and they're pressuring us to do it. I'm more likely to do it because I want all of you to think I'm a nice person. But I don't know if the like the whole like area of digital experience that leads to digital decision making. Do we really at the end try to manage like have a collective approach? Or all these like the difference conversation, the difference digital roles leads finally to more individualistic approach. So so I don't know. I, I, I that's that's another one where I don't think I can just do gospel empiricism like this to answer the question. Um in part because I think that collectivist versus individualist piece is actually much more country-centric than people want to acknowledge. I, mean, I was actually nervous coming over and presenting an SEC based paper here because GDPR is my boogeyman, right? Like up until 2017, 2018, I, I would always give lectures on there's the opt in approach in, in Europe and there's the opt out approach in America, but now it's much more sophisticated. So, so I, I think what we would have to do is do some really, really interesting contextualized work to answer that question. Because in the States, collectivist stuff doesn't work very well. Um, in, a, in another paper I had, too many papers, um, that I was working on on the flight over here, we actually looked at how different competing goals within goal systems shape individual security behavior. So it's not firm level work, it's individual level work. And we found that the beliefs around how my peers see me or my goals of being seen as a good citizen do shape security behavior. But they have nothing to do, but security goals have absolutely no impact on and most of the prescriptions that we see in cybersecurity research are all about scaring you into complying with the rules. They don't work because people don't care. However, if I tell you, if there's a, if you 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 cause the breach, I'm going to tell everyone about it. Well, you'll you'll comply, and it's not because of the threat; it's because I don't want to let my friends down. Which is kind of interesting, you know. And we, and, and that's actually one of the weaknesses I think of, of the way we constructed IS research. This is me soapbox again getting up on a soapbox again, I apologize, is we've become too, too artifact centric. So we're missing the broader social technical context for decisions, which is something I want, again, as I think about my last 10 years, it's something I want to evangelize about, is, is you know, we need to get back and actually talk about the context of technology use and the and technology as an actor as well as technology as a subject to this. And we've lost that. I like the big picture. Yeah, we really have. Like Sarker, Sarker wrote that really brilliant paper at MISQ in 2018 about returning to the social technical axis. And I think he's right. You know, I, I think if it's going to happen, it's going to happen here in Europe. It's not going to happen in the States. We're, we're, we're highly incented to teach machine learning and whatnot because the kids want to take it. You know, we're not as reflective like that as we once were. But I, but I think Sarker was right. Because everything I'm getting as I stopped doing doing as much editorial work and leadership work in the field that I've actually gotten back to talking to executives again. What we're writing about in our journals isn't, isn't their reality. I, I had a, uh, I can tell you stories. <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I'll tell this right. This will be my final thought, thought because you think about this kind of stuff, right? I, I had a, I, I used to run an institute that was tightly locked in with Salesforce.com. And I, I went in and, and, and and asked them, what do they want from me? I was trying to make a pass to do some academic research. Actually, my mindfulness work. I, I was hoping to get in and talk to some people on SMEs about being mindful about IT. And they looked at me and they said, that's not interesting at all. And that made me reframe everything in 2012. They were like, well, you know, it's, it's interesting if it's on CNN. And this was the senior vice president of software development for the whole organization. 
sitting in this conference room in a skyscraper in San Francisco, basically telling me my work was shit. And I was just like, and it, it, it appears in MISQ. And that was a real eye opening moment for me because what I learned at that moment was we have to really contextualize what we're doing. Because if I said, if I can do a more mindful IT developer, he would have said, that is awesome. And I didn't know how to craft that narrative. So, any, any of it, thank you so much for, for having me today. Thank you. Thank you. You're much kinder than I expected, so I appreciate it. <laughs> okay, can I? Uh, okay, well, thank you very much. So, so everyone, uh, okay, so uh, everyone who is coming to dinner, just stay behind so we can agree what, what to do. Uh, go to lunch, not to dinner. We know the dinner.